Wow. You can. Okay. We don't ever need to do that transition ever again. Love you. Whether you have your like, man, do we really want to welcome? I got you. I, we're, listen, we're good. Uh, before we. Uh, yeah. No, we don't need to do that. You're good. You don't ever have to welcome. I'm coming up here whether you welcome me or not. All right. So let's be clear about that. If you've got your Bibles this morning, uh, I know that we're, we're in the middle of this, uh, actually in week two, in this series on deliverance, and that's, it ties directly in with our series that we've been in uh, for a while now in the book of Acts. And so just a quick, if you're, if you're visiting or you haven't been in a minute and you're wondering how in the world do Acts and deliverance tie together, what, where, did you, where did you draw that from? Um, one of the things that happens is, is in Acts chapter 16, Paul, um, get to my notes here, Paul encounters a demon-possessed girl who, who is full of what the Bible calls a python spirit, and she is able to predict the future, by which she's able to predict the future, and the Bible says that she is able to make, uh, she's making her, her masters, because she's technically a slave girl, She's making her masters a lot of money. And after a couple days of her following them around, telling, telling people and, and almost seeming like she's doing part of the gospel's job for them in, in the sense that she is telling everyone around them that these men are from the Lord and what they're saying is true, Paul gets uh, annoyed enough that he decides to rebuke the Spirit off of her. And that's where we've come out of Acts chapter 16. When we go into talking about deliverance ministry, one of the things that's happened is this. The church has gotten away from even talking about this, much less teaching on it. And, and we'll, we will quietly say that we believe in the ministry of deliverance, which, okay, just to be clear, 970 Church, we believe in the ministry of deliverance. We also believe in talking about the ministry of deliverance. <laughs> we also believe in teaching on the ministry of deliverance, and we believe in ministering deliverance. So there, all four, right? We've talked about this for the last couple of weeks, but one of the things that we need to understand is deliverance ministry is a part of a full gospel ministry. Amen? So if basically, let me, let me say it like this. If Jesus did it and gave you authority to do it, amen? Right? Amen. And you go, well, I don't know any demon-possessed people. Oh, but beloved, just stop right there. I, I almost promise you, you know someone who may not necessarily be what we call possessed. Because our... How do I say this nicely? Our, a lot of times, our, our impression or our standard or definition of possessed is what Hollywood has pictured. And portrayed. Okay, so so are there things, and uh, and just understand, are there things that do go bump in the night, and are they ugly? Yes. And do you know what? You have the authority given to you through your relationship with Jesus to tell that thing to go, be it in your house, or on your family, or on a family member. Bye. You got to go. You cannot stay here anymore. Okay? So I want to talk this morning um, about three things, okay, that we can have demonic activity in or influencing. Okay? Let me do a quick review. We've kind of, we've been taught, there's a lot of stuff. Last week, I, I introduced it like this. We've all got our life jackets on and we are now swimming in the deep end of the pool. We gave an overview of deliverance. And, and it was through this week that we, I, I looked at it, prayed about it, looked at it, prayed about it, looked at it, prayed about it. And, and really, I was hesitant to teach this this morning, but I think it's worth it because we see it in Scripture, and I'm going to show you, okay? Um, a lot of times, we're coming at it from an understanding that believers aren't going to struggle with demonic activity in their life. And it's just not true. If you're a Christian, like I think if anything, Satan puts another target on your back. And maybe some of us this week, I, don't show your hands, but maybe some of us this week, you're like, 
yeah, that was me. I don't have just the one target because I'm made in the image of God, but I now have another target because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a spirit-filled believer and I know it. Right? Some of you are like, yes. Some of you are going, I don't know what they're talking about. But yes, I feel that. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm going to say that I've said it last week. I said it the week before. Can a Christian be underneath demonic activity in our life? And the, the short answer is yes. You don't have to know a Christian very long to determine that. <laughs> I know. I know. We're all holy. We're all, we're all, you know, none of us would ever have that problem. I just want to share with you, sometimes as Christians, we need to go get in the car wash. Now, this is not your pastor telling you to go down to Splish Splash and, and just walk through that. Don't do that, okay? But spiritually, if you would just allow this, very, allow this very crude analogy, sometimes we need to go through the car wash, right? Um, I, I tell people this all the time, that, that we need daily motivation and daily showers, right? I'm, we are a big believer on every 24 hours or sooner you need a shower. If you're a parent, you understand this dilemma, correct? If you're a wife, you understand this dilemma. Because there is nothing quite like your man coming in after having spent 10 hours outside doing God knows what, getting, getting into God knows what, and he comes in for a smoking hot kiss, and you're like, love you, shower. Now. Now. Like, I love you from a distance. Goodbye go shower right spiritually the same thing okay if we would expect to take a shower physically every 24 hours there are times we need to go stand and let the holy spirit just kind of soak and wash some things off so i I never want you to to approach holy spirit or approach the presence of god in an irreverent way does that make sense so i don't want you to think well i had five minutes with god why do i still feel icky quit that Stay underneath that shower, right? There are times we just need to be in the presence, and that's all that, that's all that needs to happen. Like, uh, and, and you can see it even in our Sunday morning services during worship. I, I will never get mad at you if you're sitting. That Yes, there are times we need to be active. There are times where we're not active enough in worship, but that's another story for another time. I'm never going to get mad at you for, for sitting in God's presence. Because for some of you, you just need to soak, right? And some of you, like, physically, you'll hang in there longer if you do sit. I've, I gotta, you've got to be okay with that. There, there have been some leg days. I wish I could have sat the whole time. Amen. Um, let's define, and, and again, we've done this before, but I just a part of our review is one a define deliverance as using the authority of Jesus to deliver people from demonic activity. It's an essential part of a full gospel ministry. Jesus gave believers authority to do it. And actually, if you hang out in the book of Acts for a little while longer, you'll discover there's this other story of where some deliverance was taking place. And and they were called the seven sons of Siva. And, And they were running around and they were ministering deliverance in the name of Jesus. But one day they came upon a demon. We'll talk about it later. One day they came upon a demon and he goes, Jesus, I know which totally blows some of our theology for out of the water for a second. The demon looks at these guys and goes, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. But none of y'all seven on my list. Because what they were doing was without relationship, they were using the name of Jesus and seeing effective power being demonstrated. That's what's scary. Okay? A Christian can come under demonic activity in our life. All right. I want to give you three areas, okay, by which we can have demonic activity, okay, influence, right? So demonic activity can influence physical healing or physical illness. Okay, so I'm going to share some examples. You go, that example sounds a lot like me, Pastor. I have changed the names and the genders of the examples to protect those that have received ministry in prayer at any point in time. Some of these people don't even think, I know who that is. Stop it! (laughs) Judgment free! Amen? Okay. 
So there was a person, an individual who came to us for prayer for a deaf ear. Right? Now remember, demonic activity can influence physical illness. As, as the other uh, person that was with me, as we began to pray, there was a prophetic word about uh, forgiveness that needed to take place first. Okay? So this person made the best decision or the second or third best decision they've ever made. They chose to forgive another person. You ever had to do that? <laughs> I'm the only one. Got it. All right. That's, I see where I'm at. Right? And here's why. Unforgiveness and bitterness are an open door for demonic activity to enter in. Okay? So as this person chose to forgive... We almost it, it's a miracle, but it's almost like you knew if this person just did this, this ear was going to open up. And sure enough, as they did it, the ear began to open up and work. Demonic activity can affect and influence physical illness. Okay, let's go to a story from Scripture. Um, it, while you're doing that, I want you to turn to Mark chapter nine. Luke, in Luke's gospel, he paints sickness in his lens or his perspective of the gospel of Luke as primarily from the devil. One of the things that um, I think is very, oh gosh, controversial, bold, but I can't find it not to be true. Jack Hayford used to call spirit or call cancer a spirit. can't prove it from scripture but man it sounds good doesn't it right i want to i want to get in there on that and you just go okay yeah lord if it is then you know what you have given your children believers authority over that spirit i i reminded of our prayer chain just probably about 10 months ago maybe a little over a year ago we were praying for someone who had stage four worst of the worst third treatment level breast cancer and we just kept praying and we just kept praying and we just kept praying and and I'm not going to sit here and, and give medical science soul credit but I would tell you this our prayers and medical treatment and Jesus that person is now cancer free completely right I, I want us to understand this and I, I want you to I want more than that, I want you to do this. Don't settle. You have, we have an enemy who is not taking quote-unquote prisoners. Does that make sense? He's, Satan's, Satan's thing is, is, and you can find this in John chapter 10, to steal, kill, and destroy. So if the enemy's not taking prisoners... Why would the church and the body of Christ? I, I've, I've said this multiple times, and I'll continue to say it. Take no prisoners, give no quarter. If you know that the enemy is at work in some area of your life, beloved, why are we tolerating it? Come on. Take no prisoners, give no quarter, right? Job illustrates that the devil has the power, the book of Job, not the book of Job, the book of Job illustrates the devil has the power to afflict. 25% of the healings in Mark's gospel involve demonic activity needing to be dealt with first. Then the physical healing comes, all right? Now, let me preface this understanding not all the sickness is demonic okay sometimes you just got a snotty cold from your kids your kids are not demonic either now stop it okay not all not all sickness is from the devil we live in a fallen broken world have you ever stubbed your toe in the middle of the night okay a demon did not move the ottoman in front of your toe right 
Have you ever stepped on a Lego? The devil straight up did that one responsible 99% of the time. If you stepped on a Lego, that's the devil. The problem, one of the issues and the big problems is in the church is we tend to have a, an extremist perspective. What do I mean? We come into this and we go, Satan's behind everything. Or the opposite is true, is that Satan's behind nothing. Neither one of those extremes are correct. Okay, well how do I know? Well, I'm glad you're asking the question. You're going to have to come back next week and the week after that in order for me to tell you. <laughs> Let's get into this morning's story. Demonic activity and healing can influence... Demonic activity can influence physical illness and healing. Mark chapter 9, if you've got your Bibles this morning, open that up. Here we go. Thank you, Devin. When they came, this is Jesus and the disciples, came to the other side, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with the disciples. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? Jesus asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, he foams at the mouth, he gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Okay, can we stop right here for just a second? Some of your translations might say he has seizures or he has epilep- some referring to epileptic or epilepsy. Okay, that's okay. Just, it's, it's a translational thing. Now, let me quantify and clarify this. Not all seizures are of Satan. But can we look at this Scripture and acknowledge some of them might be? Amen? Okay. He, he, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the Spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Well, we can talk about that another, another time, right? So they brought him, the boy, when the Spirit saw... Wait, look, watch. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw bo- the boy into a convulsion. And he fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Right? Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? The father says, from childhood. At this, it, it has often, the Spirit has often thrown him into the fire or water to what? Destroy him or kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us uh, and help us. Well, talk about faith as small as a mustard seed right there. If you can, said Jesus... Everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Uh, There's a lot going on, isn't there? Man, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. He says, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. Verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up to his feet, and he stood up. We'll, we'll just stop right there. All right, let's unpack a couple things here, okay? The first thing is this. You have a deaf and mute spirit who has, who, who has control or influence over a person. And Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration... If, you've, if you're familiar with this passage at all, by the way, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? He comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. The skies have been rent into Peter, Paul, Peter, no, sorry, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Peter, James, and John are with, I don't, they might have been with Jesus, but he doesn't record it. But for sure, Peter, James, and John are with him. And. They see Moses on one side, they see Elijah on the other. You have Jesus fulfilling both like the law and the prophets. And you would think like, if I'm a demonic spirit, surely this is not the time to approach the Son of God. But nonetheless, Jesus comes down from the mountain. The disciples are gathered there. There's a gentleman there, and a father. And, and you've got to give the father credit. He recognizes that this is a spirit. Can, you, can, you, can we understand that? The father, who we don't know if he's a believer or not. So if he's a believer, great, dad's doing his job. If he's not a believer, he recognizes this thing is evil and it's a spirit. 
And they bring it to the disciples, and the disciples can't cast the thing out. That's another story for another time. Jesus comes down from the mountain. He sees there's an argument now breaking out between his disciples and the religious leaders. Right? (laughs) They're arguing about why the thing can't come out. The father intervenes, and sa- or Jesus asks, what's the argument all about? The father explains him, this is a spirit that, that has influence or an activity level. We would say, from the word daemonizomai, it doesn't mean os- possessed or oppressed. What it means is a little, a medium, or a large. Right? You've got, you got a little demonic activity, you got a medium amount of demonic activity, or you got a full-on amount of demonic activity. This story, full-on amount of demonic activity. Okay? That any time any time that this spirit takes over the body of the boy, it it looks like he is having an epileptic seizure or an epileptic episode. Jesus says, the father says, let's go back and look at this for just a second. Okay? Wouldn't you know it? I'm in the wrong thing. Ha ha. Turn to the wrong one. There we go. <laughs> Teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Or some translations say it's a deaf and mute spirit. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, he gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. I want us to understand with this thing um, this spirit. They went to cast out. Part of why they can't cast it out, we learn from Matthew, is a part of their faith. Since, since we can talk about it just a little bit, um, I would just tell you, I would tell you this. The understanding of exorcism and deliverance at that point in time and culture was I need the person who we are exercising this demonic activity from to either be able to hear, he or see, and in either one of those, speak. Well, if he's got a deaf spirit and a mute spirit, or deaf and mute spirit, he can't do those. Why? Well, you go, Why is that important? Because a lot of times they would get the person who was being delivered, they would have them read and speak out loud, or hear and repeat back, speaking out loud, the, the prayer, if you would, of deliverance. So... They're going, we don't, have a, we don't have a place, we don't have space for this to land. In other words, we've never seen this done before. Now keep in mind, Jesus has just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's also fed the 5,000, and he's also fed the 4,000. So if you would for a second, there's been a lot of other things that they've seen him do that they didn't have space for before. So why would they think this is too, is too hard or too difficult for him to do, not only that, that at this stage in their walk with God, Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us about the last 12 to 18 months of Jesus' ministry before the cross. John gives us a kind of a comprehensive all three years. They've already been empowered or given his authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils. So why is this one any different? It's connected to their faith level. That's why, that's why Mark and Luke and Matthew all have as part of this story, how long will I be with you, O unbelieving and perverse generation? He's not necessarily talking to the crowd. He's talking to his disciples. Boys, how many times do I have to do this? Right? He can't be healed until we first take care of the demonic. Does that make sense? Not every... Not every person who needs healing has demonic activity in their life. (laughs) You're like, yes, that's me. (laughs) I've been healed, and I'm positive there's no demonic activity. Fair. Some of us, we're not getting healing because there's a wide open door, and there might actually be some demonic activity taking place, taking place. Right? One of the big ones, we're going to talk about open doors more in depth next week. One of the big ones, I already shared it with the first story, was talking about unforgiveness and bitterness. Okay? 
sin, any sin we might have, can also be an open door. Especially if it's going unrepented of and we're looking to justify the thing that we're in love with. Does that make sense? Let me, let me give you some more wisdom here. We can't disciple a demon. You can't cast out the flesh. Does this make sense? Let me say it again. You can't disciple the demonic. If it's demonic, you have to deal with it by casting it out and shutting the door. And like having the Holy Spirit nail that thing shut. <laughs> Amen? Okay. You also can't cast out the flesh. Yet we have to be able to discern between the two. Understanding that the Father has given us authority over both. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, again, all names, genders, they're all changed. We were praying for a person on an individual one time who, for, for lack of a better term, as we were praying, what we were praying for either moved or got worse. Well, that a lot of times, that's demonic activity. Okay, It doesn't necessarily mean every time it's demonic activity, but a lot of times, when you put your thumb on something, it's, it's there. And I'll tell you another story here in just a second. Um, as we were praying for this person, and that began to happen, there was a prophetic word or vision of something like a tentacle having wrapped itself around this, a specific body part, an area of this person. Okay, what they're experiencing physically is a direct draw now from what's happening spiritually. Does this make sense? You got this. Okay, so what do you need to do? Well, we can keep praying for physical healing, but we're, we're now chasing a tiger by the tail. Okay, which is not as dangerous as you think because you have the authority, right? So over the next probably 15 to 20 minutes of praying for that person, there were some things that were, was revealed through words of knowledge that needed to be dealt with first. And when those got dealt with, guess what happened? Immediately, immediately, like... Within minutes, healing came. Okay? Now, there's another... Th uh, we got. Uh, listen, I'm glad we're a church of testimonies. Amen? There's another individual... Now I'm trying to make sure that I've, I've got everything correct. Uh, if you were here that morning, then you kind of know some of the details. But for those of you that weren't here that morning, we had an individual who had joined uh, a certain branch of the military... And part of their training was to attend, uh, mand they had to go to mandatory yoga classes. Now, I'm not here to talk about the evils of yoga. But I'm just, I'm here to clarify, and you can Google check me. Pull out your Google machine. Those yoga poses were actually designed to worship deities. In Hindu? Hindu, Hindi, that area. So when you're doing a downward dog, it's not just the fact that you look like an idiot. It's also that, that that pose was designed to... You're like, I'm just making sure you're alive. Okay? That pose was designed to worship something that, quite honestly, goes bump in the night. All right? And if you don't believe me, that morning, there was definitely... And you go, what did it unlock? Well, it unlocked something called the Kundalini Spirit. You go, what is that? It's a teaching that aligns the seven chakras or the seven energies of the body. And you're like, wait a minute, I've heard this before. Yeah, you probably have. The, word, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge for someone dealing with a spirit of death. A couple people stepped out, we prayed for them. I was awesome. The Lord's like, I'm not done. There's something there, and, and this is what this is, I'll just tell you what the Holy Spirit laid on my heart and told me was it's specifically about being choked. 
Okay. So when you're, we, we prophesy in part, we know in part, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So I said, okay, this is what this, this is the second part of what we know. A person jumped out into the middle of the aisle and, oh boy, we had a little bit of a fight on our hands, right? Some, some wise, mature, actually one of our elders named Todd was here that morning so I'm standing up here and I'm kind of like the cruise director just saying, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? What are we praying for next? And as this person responded, right, they went down on the second row. There were some pre-believers up here on the front row. <laughs> how many of you know, according to, according to how you build the church, we don't have massive demonstrations of power in front of people who are not Christians yet. Second row, right behind them, There's a deliverance from a kundalini spirit taking place. And I'm going, and this is why we don't do yoga. Amen. (laughs) The person who got delivered was that we were able to connect with them after service and go, hey, so powerful time in prayer this morning. What happened? Right? And, And this is what they were able to communicate was I was in an, I was in a branch of service in the military that had us do yoga as part of our physical therapy and stuff. And they came in that morning, and I mean, during worship, the presence of the Lord was strong enough that, that they felt ill and began to manifest. And our, one of our board members and elders of the church named Todd Sorensen literally had his hand over a knot in the pit of her stomach. And I, I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to exaggerate, I'm just trying to get you a picture what it looked like was he had his hand over what appeared to be um, a snake that was trying to move around right over there over her gut. Now, you, now, if you know Todd, Todd is not a small man. He's bigger than me. And he's got giant-sized mitts. Okay, And I'm like, Todd, if you squeeze her gut anymore, her intestines are going to come popping out of her belly button. And then we're going to have a different mess in healing we've got to pray for. And it wasn't, it wasn't that. It was there was something he had his hand over. And I believe, Jessica, you were there. It was something that he literally had his hand on. And it was wrenching her. Because when, when the Spirit manifests, normally, that's game over. That's the... Because here, here's what... Here's what the demonic wants to do. It wants to justify why it gets to stay hidden. This is why unforgiveness and bitterness are so powerful, a stronghold. Because we justify, you don't know what happened to me. Maybe I don't. Um, I, I believe in James chapter 5. If you're, I'm sorry, I'm wrestling with my microphone this morning. Um, James chapter 5, let me just read it to you. Devin doesn't have it on the screen. You write down the address if you want it. I read this in our prayer meeting on Wednesday night. James chapter 5, verse 13. It says, is any one of you in trouble? Then he should pray. That seems like kind of a duh, doesn't it? Okay, is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise or let him testify. Is any one of you sick? He should call on the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if he has sinned. Watch, he'll be forgiven. Now, then he says this, Therefore, and, and this is what makes the spiritual community such an interesting and intricate dynamic part of prayer and healing ministry. Therefore, he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Many of you have been around 970 Church for a long time, and I'm about to share something I don't, I don't share that often, if that ever. Many of you know that I was sexually abused for two years. And we've, I've walked through that forgiveness. Well, remember we kind of introduced and talked about like the car wash and prayer. And it's possible for maybe some of our lives to come up underneath some demonic activity and influence. And it takes presence and time with Holy Spirit to 
like future things down the road maybe. Are you, you good with that? So I had a soul tie, and I'll explain what that is in just a second, but I had a soul tie not just with my abuser, and I'm, I'm probably going to open up Pandora's box. Yay. I had a soul tie with my abuser, but I also had a soul tie with someone that she had also abused. Let me explain. A soul tie is when the Bible says that the, a, a man and a woman... When, when there is sexual unity, they come together. That's why the Bible says, let no man tear apart or tear asunder what the Lord has put together. Like You are united with your then spouse who, who is uniquely and created, designed so that the two of you would become one. I hope I do not need to go into an anatomy lesson this morning. Although there are no kids in here, so we'll probably get away with it. Do you, are you with me? You understand this. I don't need to explain this. You got it. Are you, some of you are like, I don't know. No, stop it. Don't Google that either, by the way. It's bad. Okay? So anytime we unite ourselves sexually with someone, not our spouse be it pre-marriage or post-marriage, there's a piece of them you're bringing with. And there's a piece of you they're taken with. Well, I have a great mentor um, who said, right after I got saved, he's like, you're struggling with some sexual sin. I'm like, yep. And he goes, I think there's a soul tie here. And I think as long as there's a soul tie here, you're going to go back and you're going to try to get with her every single time. I want to pray with you. And he led me through a quick prayer. And it was like somebody just walked over and went, and just turned the light switch off. Okay. So that's deliverance. Now, if you take Hollywood's exorcist definition of deliverance, my head should have spun around and pea soup should have come out. No. So this week... I'm going through this book, Liberated, by Rodney Hogue. I shared it with you last week. And I have some prayers printed out here at the end of, for the end of service. The Lord revealed to me, he goes, you have a soul tie with the other person. Now, this is the part that I don't share. Is that the person who abused me was also abusing another boy in the church. And this is why, like, don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you right now, if you have kids, even though they're in church and even though they're from, quote unquote, the Christian family, you don't often know what's going on. And, and we accidentally, as parents, sometimes just, I don't mean open the door, I'm talking about blow open the door off the hinges for our kids to experience the same generational curse that's been going on. Are you following my meaning this morning? So... You, and I know this is the part that's Pandora's box. Is you take two kids that have been abused by the same abuser and they start talking about it and all of a sudden you have two kids that came together in a sexual union. I'm just one half of that puzzle. And the Lord went, you've got a soul tie here to this other, now he's a man. And I want to heal you from that. I have kids. What's, what's happening? The soul ties trying to justify why you don't have to deal with it. I married, happily, for 20 years. It'll be 19 in August. We get 20 for bad behavior, anyway. <laughs> God, I don't have to deal with this. My mother-in-law is right there, by the way. So, like, you want to talk about confess your sin one to another. Look, I'm just confessing an area that the Lord had to come heal. And I'm not really good with the feelings and the sharing of the emotions. Mm -hmm. 
so I called my brother. I said, I need to talk to you. Because we're getting ready to go on a Wednesday night. And the Lord's doing a work. And I need to confess to you, my brother, what's, what's happened and what the Holy Spirit is doing. And he goes, dude, let's go through the car wash. I said, yeah. No, I'm not here. I'm not trying to evoke an emotion out of you. What, what you're experiencing, some of you right now, that is the mercy and the grace of the Heavenly Father. And there's just a... St- just the, there's just a little bit of conviction right here. And that conviction is this. Him, I want to heal this area of your life. But you have to let me. Okay. Well, I'm going through the car wash. I'm going through the car wash. Well, that part was hidden underneath your undercarriage. And no one would have ever seen it. But my heavenly father saw it. And he went, I think we're ready. (laughs) After 30 some odd years, I I think, if you'll just let me just, I'm trying to think of an analogy that that would work without it being too crude. Because, I mean, you want to talk about getting emails. Just draw incorrect analogies in order for people to connect with and somebody tears it up because it doesn't cover all the bases. All right. Demonic activity can, af- can affect physical healing. Part two. I don't know, I'm going to need more than 15 minutes, but it's okay. I prepared the kids ministries team like we're going to be a little longer today. Demonic activity can influence mental illness. Now, not all mental illness is a result of demonic activity. We live in a fallen world. Sometimes wires get crossed. Sometimes wires just come disconnected. Sometimes stuff just happens. Amen? Okay, now, sometimes, and I'm going to show you in Scripture in Mark chapter 5, verse one, verses 1 through 15, and everybody knows this story but it's where the demonic activity can influence mental health or mental illness. Uh, Devin, Mark chapter 5, 1 through 15. Uh, They went across to the lake of the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man, and I'm going to just offer up a different translation here in just a second. Leave us at verse 2, Dev. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure, some translations are going to say unclean spirit, some things are going to say an evil spirit. Some translations are going to say a demonic spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Matthew records that there's two. Can we just go, with, can we live with the one we know about? We don't know what happened to the other one, but we do know Mark and Luke give us one. Right? He, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an, unc- un- with an unclean spirit. Notice that it doesn't say that the unclean spirit had him. It says he had an impure spirit. He came from the tombs to meet him. Verse 3. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with the chain. Let me just stop. Just go back, Dev. Uh, this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. Did you notice where he's living? He's living amongst death. Right? This spirit that has influence over his life has driven him into a place of uncontrolled isolation and eventual death. Does this make sense? Boy, there is not a clearer picture of what the enemy wants to do, not just to every believer, but every single literal human being on the face of the planet because of Imago Dei. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, which tells us this. That you leave it there. Leave it on verse 4. Okay, we'll go back to verse 3. <laughs> We're good. And verse 4. There, there. Right? Right? He had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons off his feet. In other words, they had tried under normal human circumstances at that time to subdue him. Okay? But oftentimes he broke the irons on his feet, 
No one was strong enough to even subdue him anymore. Verse 5. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Stop. We're good. What's happening is, is this thing is driving him crazy. So much so that he is crying out amongst the tombs at night, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. We would say in both of the stories that I'm reading to you this morning, these are not a little, these are not a medium. This is not a, this is not a personal pan pizza, this is not a medium pan pizza. This is a family large, extra, extra spicy, demonic activity level going on. Okay, verse 6, Dev. When he, wow, I love this. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Both instances, a parent and the demon, or the person and the demon, recognize Jesus. Right? Verse 7. He shouted, this is the guy, at the top of his lungs, this is the demon speaking through the man, what do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. Well, that would just mess up your theology, won't it? Now, the demon, first off, the demon recognizes Jesus and says, Son of the Most High God. Well, that would be enough of an endorsement if I was a disciple right there, wouldn't it? Like, here comes this naked guy who's got obviously some mental health issues <laughs> running up to us naked, bruised, beaten, and in a, in, in, in a tomb or basically right outside of a tomb in a, in a cemetery, okay, shouting at the top of his lungs, what do you want with me? It's not the appropriate time to torture us, isn't it? Who exactly are we traveling with? He says, in God's name, don't torture me. Verse 8, for Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Now, stop right there for a second, thanks. There are two ways to tell this story. There, there's a way that the man runs up and yells this, and somewhere during the interaction from running up, Jesus tells the spirit to leave. Or, Jesus sees him, he sees the spirit. Jesus goes to deal immediately with the spirit, and the Spirit uses the man's voice and reacts. Are you good with both? It's one or the other. I can't pinpoint which one. I just want to make sure we explained it. Verse 9. Okay? Jesus asked him, what is your name? Let's stop right there. Again, Scripture talks about, is he talking to the demon or is he talking to the man? Yes. He's talking to, and one of them chooses to answer. My personal thought is, I think he's talking to the guy. Okay? I can't necessarily prove that, but what we know from Scripture and what we know from deliverance ministry is this. The Lord is, all, is always about silencing the enemy for, and protecting or the dignity of the person in the moment. Okay. He says, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. I don't know why he's telling him the truth, but he is. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Verse 11 says, A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. Verse 12 says, The demons begged Jesus, Send us in among the pigs. Allow us to go into the pigs. And, and he, he gave them permission. And the impure spirit came out, or spirits came out, and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And that's why we don't eat deviled ham. I, every time I read this publicly, I have to make that joke. I apologize. I need prayer. And there you go. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Verse 15, here's our testimony. When they came to Jesus, watch, they saw the man who had been possessed or had been had by an evil spirit, a legion of demons, watch, sitting there, dressed in his right mind. And they were the ones who were afraid. It shouldn't have been tended pigs anyway. But it, I, we digress. There's a, there's a whole cultural thing going on behind the scenes. Can we, can we just acknowledge a couple things that when we first read this story, first off, this guy's not in his right mind. 
First of all, you don't live in a cemetery willingly. You don't necessarily howl day and night self-harming. The Bible says he was cutting himself. Right? Are you starting to put the pictures together? Are these pieces sliding into the puzzle for you? Okay? That's why one of the open doors, or I should say one of the signs of demonic activity is a lot of times cutting yourself. By the way, Jesus likes to heal those scars physically. And I'll just in general say this, unless you're at a nudist colony, which is probably for another time, you don't just willingly run around naked. Just generally frowned upon, especially in public. Some of you don't know what to do with that. I leave that alone. Sometimes demonic activity can influence physical illness. Sometimes it can influence mental illness. Is it the case 100% of the time? No. What does it take? It takes discernment. It takes a willingness to go in there and go, you know what? There is something more going on here. And realizing, and, and this is what I love about Christ. In both stories, Jesus, Jesus is not just teaching us how to minister deliverance. He's teaching us how to have love and compassion on the person. This man was restored after the demonic activity had taken place. What was unique about his restoration is, and I don't know how, I don't know where, but he's clothed, sitting in his right mind. Jesus doesn't just leave him how he found him. Never, never does he, he loves us too much. Let me say it like this. He loves us too much to leave us how he found us. He loves you too much. He loves you too much to leave you like he found you. And Jesus doesn't just want to, Jesus doesn't want, want you just to go to the second hand store. Because that's, that's not restoration. That's a patchwork. That's a band-aid. If you'd allow this analogy, Jesus would like you to be decked out in Prada. Some Louis Vuitton. Some, some Versace. And you're like, why don't, I mean, I'm just worthy of this. I'm not necessarily worthy of the other things. Not feeling like you're worth the full price Jesus paid is a sign there might be some demonic activity taking place. Um, Pastor Bo's got him. So we're going to do something and if you're going to talk about deliverance we might as well pray and you're like what, is, what are we going to do well I read to you James chapter 5 we're going to pray for one another and if you right now are feeling maybe uh, a little uncomfortable I would, I would just tell you with respect and honor if you need to excuse yourself now would be the appropriate time. If you want prayer, just for, yeah, Pastor Bo's going to hand those out. To, if you're married, we're just going to ask you to share one. And, and we promise that we'll get some made up next week if we don't have enough. Um, these are prayers of identity, um, breaking off word curses, breaking soul ties, and we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go over it a little bit more in detail here in just a second, but we're going to break up into groups of two and four. 
and we're going to pray for one another. And you go, well, pastor, what if I find myself like the person I'm praying for and then like go full on out into a hissy fit? You have people who are prepared to deal with hissy fits. And the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to grab your hand and we're going to deal with that hissy fit together. Because long has it been in the body of Christ since every believer knew how to handle a good demon. Some of you, you're just going to cry. The Lord's going to come and minister. It's going to be awesome. And there will be no hissy fits, no pea soup. Okay? Some of you, you might feel nauseous. And all I'm going to tell you is this. In the name of Jesus, I command that nausea to leave right now. In the name of Jesus, I command that apprehension to leave your body right now. You didn't know you could take authority and do that. Well, I'm going to show you next week where you can. This is your car wash. Let's just call it, let's just call it a good overview car wash. On page one, you've got identity and doctrinal affirmation. Identity is who you are in Christ, and this, this backs up. You got what, you, what he says you got, and you are who he says you are. Not who you say you are, who he says you are. Then you've got a breaking word curses, because some of us, like we're running around, and we've, we have worn the, the mud that other people have thrown at us with their words. And that's a direct, that comes in direct conflict with who Jesus says you are. What does that mean? If someone told you you were worthless, then how come the Son of God came and paid a price for you? That means you're worth it. You're worth Him. If someone says you're stupid, no, the Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. If someone says you're accident prone, I don't have the scripture in front of you, but I'm sure there's a good one in there. Read it. It also goes over in case some of us have issued curses. Right? Because we gotta we gotta deal with that too, right? There's breaking soul ties at the bottom of page one. If you turn the page over or open it up, you'll see there's breaking generational curses. Now, yeah, I'm in full belief. Jesus came and did all that according to the book of Galatians. But if you and I don't have access to it, you're st- I, and we talked last week about if, you're, if, if there's ever been any masonry or witchcraft in your past, that that can be generational because those vows that are made and those covenants that are made in masonry are actually passed down specifically to the second, third, and fourth generation. Right? Okay, then there's a prayer of forgiveness. And here's the one I would, I would land on this morning. How many of you, you just show of hands, you got somebody in your life, yep, I need to forgive them. Okay, so let's start right here. After I pray with you, what I want you to do is this. Break up into groups of two and th- four. Be available to pray with each other. Even if, look, maybe you didn't, maybe you're going, eh, I don't need anything this morning. I just got a headache. Eh, let's pray for a headache. Some of you like, well, some of you like are in organ failure. We need to pray. <laughs> some of you got stuff that's torn up in your body because the enemy's decided to run a four-wheeler on the internal side, right? We just need to pray. And while we pray, let the Holy Spirit minister and lead. Amen. All right, you said you, you were a forgiver. You, you raised your hand. You said, I need to pray the prayer of forgiveness. Can I see your hands again? <laughs> Probably everybody in the room. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, and I'm going to ask you say this loud enough where you hear your voice. You good? In the name of Jesus, I choose to forgive as I have been forgiven. And I now choose to forgive, and you're going to say the name of the person, so now that you know what's going to happen, I choose to forgive. I release any right I have retained to bring revenge. I release them from my hands and place them into your hands 
Jesus, the just judge. I break every curse. I have sent them and call forth a blessing to them instead. Thank you for the grace to forgive and the power to live in freedom. You go, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this publicly. You know what? That's why I put them in your hands. Because sometimes you need to go through the car wash just you and the Holy Spirit. Now here's what I want you to do. I'm asking you by faith to break out, turn around, break out into groups or two or four. Right here, no, right now, break out into groups or two or four. Our pastoral staff will jump in right alongside you. Okay? Two or four. And if you need healing for anything, a headache, a thumbnail, kidney failure. By, by the way, the kidneys are improving in the name of Jesus, right? This morning we said we aim it at one. So it's like golf. The, the, the lower your score, the better you are. And it was going down, correct? So ladies, you know what to aim at over there. Right? You go, well, who else can we pray? Who else can pray? You guys can come up here. We'll pray. I'll turn the microphone off. <laughs> Devin's going to turn on some light prayer worship music just so that we can minister to one another. James chapter 5, right here. If you need to do a group of five, do a group of five. Let me read this over you one more time. James chapter 5, you're officially dismissed. So as your group ends up, wraps up prayer, you can go home. He says, James chapter 5, verse 13, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. If anyone is happy, let him sing songs of praise and testify. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Father, we just release prayer healing all over this place right now in the name of Jesus. For those who need ministry, Lord, we are following James chapter 5 as the example. We're confessing one to another right now anything that needs to be confessed. We're believing that sins are going to be forgiven. We're believing, Father, according to your word, healing would be released. Deliverance would be experienced. Freedom in the name of Jesus, we pray.